Hello and welcome to today's video. Today we're actually going to do something a bit different. We're going to do a live stream Q&A for gut health questions. Honestly, you can ask me any questions, but I'm trying to keep it a bit more specifically gut health. And I already have a big list of 20 plus questions to get me started today. But if you have questions, please leave them for me. I love to do I love to do these things live. It's a lot of fun because we can do a little bit of back and forth. So I'm just going to start right at the top. I'm just going to start with the first question that I've got. So, first question from Jeff Bergman. I think this is a bit of a cheeky question, actually. How to feel 60 to 80% better in two to three days, naturally? Like, <laughs> that's a, there's a bit, there's some high expectations on that question there. I'm going to say, first of all, it's really hard to say because I don't know what's wrong. One of the reasons that I, the initial consultation I offer when I work with somebody is called a root cause consultation. This is because what you're going to do that's going to make you feel 60 to 80% better is going to look different depending on what your symptoms are. Your symptoms are biofeedback. They are how your body is talking to you. They're how your body is telling you what is wrong. So depending on your symptoms, you're going to need to do different things. I will be honest, 60 to 80% better in two to three days. That's a tough one. I have seen it. I have seen it. I have seen, I've seen a 60 to 80% improvement in, in a handful of my clients in two to three days with the correct changes. So I'm going to say this is, you're usually going to be in a, in a case like this, you're usually going to be looking for low hanging fruit. So you're going to be looking for things that are, you could say like obvious, obvious clues, obvious symptoms that need to be addressed and have a, an easy, easy thing to address. So this might look like, at least initially, restricting foods from the diet. If you're eating foods that you can't digest, you will feel bad when you eat them. Unquestionably, you, you just will. You can't, you can't eat a food that you can't digest and feel good. It's not possible because you've got stuff that's going through your gut. It's rotting. It's fermenting it's irritating you're not going to feel good so removing the things that are causing you problems that's a really good start so remove the things that are that are missing something else would be you need to add back in the things that that that, that you need that aren't there i don't know what that's going to be but your symptoms will tell you the best place i could point you would be to look at the five pillars course that we have so the five pillars are the five primary core indivisible functions of the digestive system these are stomach acid. You've probably heard of these before, like probably. Stomach acid, digestive enzymes, bile, motility, and mucosa. If you have a problem with one of these five, you're going to have some digestive symptoms. If you can identify, based on what your symptoms are, which one of these five pillars is dysfunctional, you can correct it with dietary, lifestyle, and supplemental changes. And if you do that, you'll see improvements quickly. You, you will. You will see them very, very fast. So, Jeff, very cheeky question, but... That is the best I can answer it for, for you for today. Genia Tafoya Padilla says, her question is, how do you heal SIBO? This is a good question. I want you to change your perspective on SIBO a little bit. Instead of seeing it as a problem that you have to fix, instead of seeing it as like a, as like a, a condition that needs treatment or something that needs to be like solved, almost think about SIBO like a pet. You like you need to take care of it. If you take care of it properly, it will it will go away by itself. But trying to kill it is not how you take care of SIBO. It doesn't work. I've seen. I, I usually I'll be honest. I usually end up working with people that have SIBO that try to do killing protocols and they don't work. But this is a lot of people, and for for a very good reason. SIBO is an adaptive response. It's it's a symptom, you know, and. Even in, you can go to other places, like in looking functional medicine, looking alternative medicine, everyone will be telling you, don't chase the symptoms, chase the root cause. SIBO is, is a symptom. It's not a root cause. Yes, it's uncomfortable. Yes, it causes food sensitivities. It can cause malabsorption. It can cause a lot of different issues, but it's not a root cause. So you need to tackle the root cause and then the symptom will go away. Killing SIBO doesn't make sense. Instead, you need to look at why is it there? And, and and I'm kind of parroting myself, but this is this is the truth. If you have SIBO, I I unquestionably, like without a single shred of doubt, know that you have dysfunction in at least one of, if not more, of the five pillars. 
stomach acid, digestive enzymes, bile, motility, and mucosa. If you focus on these five things, you will fix like 97% of problems. Your digestive system is a complex, is a complex process, is a complex machine. But it, it, it is that it is definable. It has a, a, a process that it that it goes through to digest food, and it's these five steps. If you're missing one, you will have problems. But if we can correct it, it will fix it. SIBO very often is connected to either to to the, I would say the most common ones that it's connected. It, it could be all of them. Actually, I'll be completely honest. It could be all of them. Low stomach acid can cause SIBO. Having a digestive enzyme insufficiency can cause SIBO because your body uses digestive enzymes to break down biofilms and to break down your food. If you don't break down your food, you will develop SIBO to eat the food for you because otherwise it's putrefying, which is which is worse than having SIBO. If you don't have bile, if you don't have like healthy bile, bile is like soap, it cleans your intestines and it's how you remove fat soluble toxins. Very often people develop SIBO because they have a fat soluble, um, they have like chronic fat soluble toxicity. So they're exposed to mold or they have amalgam fillings or plastics pesticides estrogens the, the list the list goes on but fat soluble toxins in your bile will cause SIBO to happen if your motility doesn't work you will get SIBO if you're if you so motility is that like rhythmic wave of your intestines as they do that wiggling movement if that doesn't work correctly you will have SIBO and finally uh, mucosa if your mucosa is damaged you don't have the correct immune system in your digestive system you won't be able to house the correct organisms. You won't have brush border enzymes that help you break your food down correctly. And again, you, you feed dysbiotic organisms. It's always, and, it's, and I'm saying always, and I really mean it, it's always one of the five pillars. So fix, fix them. Like they're, 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 they're things that you can actually take care of and you can, you can improve. And if you do that, you'll see that down the line, SIBO will, will disappear. It will, it will resolve itself. So I can see we have five people live. If you have questions, give me your questions. I'd way prefer to answer your questions live than answering these questions that I've already got because then we can go back and forth and I can I can get more feedback and it's it's better, it's more helpful for you. So if you have questions, please let me know. This is a QA. and a Excuse me. <coughs> it's a QA. and a Let me know. So next question from Jizzy Honeybee Martin. Uh, the question is, how to improve my stomach motility for someone with gastroparesis so gastroparesis is interesting the stomach's not emptying on a physiological level so looking at this through this five pillars perspective this this is usually either connected to uh, stomach acid or motility stomach acid if you can if you don't get your stomach acid to a low enough ph so if you don't get your stomach acid strong enough the the stomach doesn't want to open it doesn't want to let the food out because it's not digested correctly. And the stomach knows if I let this food release into the small intestine, it's gonna feed SIBO, it's gonna feed parasites, it's gonna, it's not gonna do anything other than create inflammation. We're not gonna absorb anything from it. So the stomach will hold it and it will, what it's trying to do is hold it while it's trying to produce more acid, but it's struggling for some reason. So supplementing acid could be helpful there. If it's more connected to the motility pillar, I find motility is the hardest pillar to work with physical interventions like supplements and lifestyle changes and things like that. Gastroparesis is really connected to trauma. It's really connected to uh, the fight, flight, freeze response, particularly the freeze component. When your body goes into a state of freeze, your digestive system literally shuts down. And gastroparesis, it, it, it's literally an indicator that your stomach has shut down, it's not working. So if you have trauma there, working through that freeze response is the is going to be the only thing that changes it. If you you can take all of the motility enhancers, you can take Proculopride, you can take 5-HTP, you can you can walk as much as you want, you can do all of the like if your body is still holding the trauma and it's stuck in a freeze state, nothing's going to change it but resolving that. So that's where you would need to work. So they're the two most common um, interventions that you need for gastroparesis that I find. Uh, so next question, uh, Cindy L. Goddard says, how do you cure leaky gut? That's a good question. And surprise, surprise, I'm going to give you the same answer. If you take care of the five pillars, you will fix leaky gut. So your gut will be leaky if it has things in it that aren't supposed to be there. And if your food isn't digested correctly, it will irritate your gut lining. 
The biggest things that cause leaky gut are undigested food, so correcting your stomach acid, digestive enzymes, and bile are the biggest influences on that, on whether you're actually digesting your food correctly. Biggest, um, biggest thing that you can do there. But you also need to look at the microbiome. So your microflora are like builders that live on your gut lining. And if your gut lining is damaged, they don't, they're not happy. And if you don't have the right bugs there, they cannot heal the gut lining. So think about, like, f for the sake of it, you could literally imagine that your, your gut lining cannot heal without the correct microbes. It's impossible. Like, they do it. They're, and they don't. They don't. Obviously, your body is what's doing it. But they're kind of like the, imagine like in a construction site, you've got the surveyor and you've got the construction manager. You know, they're organizing everything. They're telling everyone where to go. They're saying, like, this building needs this material and this is where we're going to pull the concrete. And we're going to put the scaffolding here and this and that and that. They're organizing everything. If you don't have these right bugs, your gut doesn't know how to function correctly. So your gut lining is going to try to reproduce and the cells are going to be like all like misshapen and they're not going to be with the correct integrity between them. And it's just like a construction site, but all the people that are building aren't building together as a team. They're just like doing their own thing. And imagine that times a million for all of the cells that you have in your digestive system. And you've just got this big mess. So we need the right microbes in our gut to orchestrate this process. So fixing the five pillars and working on your microbiome, definitely, unquestionably, the best way for you to, to heal your, your leaky gut. Obviously, you have to think about root causes as well. That's going to be different for everyone. So there's no way I can really tell you what to do there. But address root cause is always a prerequisite. And from there, look at your five pillars. Cool. Any questions so far? Please do do comment, wh whatever it is. As long as it's gut health related, I'm quite happy to answer it. <coughs> so we have a question here from Rhonda Dion Spuler. Is there a perfect diet for gut health? My doc keeps pushing whole 30, but doesn't really talk about histamine. I just feel like it's too complicated to even tackle too many variables. That's a really good question. So what I want you to do here is forget the idea of a perfect diet, like full stop, but there is a perfect diet for you. There is a perfect diet for you, but it's not going to be any diet that you find on the internet. The best way you can use these internet diets, so you look, you can look at Whole 30, as you said here, or you could look at low FODMAP, you could look at the GAPS diet or the specific carbohydrate diet, you could look at paleo or keto, like you can look at all these diet ideas. And what I would suggest you do is take from them what serves you and discard the rest. So in my case, I used the GAPS diet for a really long time, but I also had histamine intolerance. And the GAPS diet, if for anyone that knows, is really heavy on high histamine things. You know, you've got fermented vegetables, you've got bone broth, you've got like a lot of things that are just were inaccessible to me. So I just took what I could from it and left the rest. The things that I couldn't do, I just didn't do them. But that took me a long time to figure out. I kept trying to drink the broth and it was like histamine reaction, histamine reaction, histamine reaction, and it sucked. And then I learned like, oh, I don't have to do what it says. I can follow my own, my own insight. And it, it, this is hard because this is, this is a big part of healing is becoming sovereign again. And it's taking full responsibility for what's happening. Like if you're doing a diet and you're just saying like, oh, I'm doing whole food, I'm doing whole 30 or I'm doing the gaps diet. Like if it's going wrong, it's not your fault. It's whoever made the diet's fault. But if you fully take responsibility for what goes into your body and you say, okay, I'm not doing this diet or that diet. I'm doing my diet. I'm doing what works for me. And oh, the Mediterranean diet is, is a good idea because it's got this olive oil. I'm going to take that. That olive oil works really well for me. And GAPS diet, like the broth works well for me there, but I can't do the fermented foods. So I'm not going to do that. Like take the bits that sound good, that make sense to you and bring them all together and create your own perfect diet. And in, it, in its own way, like that kind of sovereignty over your healing process is healing in itself. That's that's really how it works. Instead of externalizing it and trying to put the responsibility outside of you, like bring it all in. And that's where you'll really find healing. So there is no perfect diet for everyone, but there is a perfect diet for you, but only you can find it. So you have to try lots of different things, take what works for you and, and leave the rest. If you want some more bullet points, like some ideas to explore, you can go and check my YouTube channel. So you can search William Dickinson, what diet to eat to heal your gut. I've got a video that walks you through the core principles of things that you need to have in a, in a healing diet. And you can go and read that video, but again, apply the same template. Like I'm talking about eating liver in there. If you can't eat liver, then don't do it. Like when I was in the, the hardest part of my healing process, I couldn't eat liver either. And I still healed, you know, you don't have to do 
exactly the way that it's explained. Just take what you can from it and leave the rest. Leave what doesn't work for you. Okay, next question from Claude Scott. So let's see. After 18 months as a long hauler, so I'm guessing that's a COVID long hauler, uh, what might help me? I am 66, with he was healthy, slim, in shape, not taking any pills before COVID. I will eat and do anything. My main symptoms are low energy, brain fog, itchy skin, mostly legs and feet. So, gen okay, so general rule of thumb for, for COVID, this is my sort of like broad spectrum treatment plan this is like what it would look like if i had long covid this is what i would be looking at doing so you've got almost universally people that have long covid they are missing lactobacillus and bifidobacterium in their gut especially bifidobacterium so you would want to work on supplementing those those probiotics it's very likely when you do it will actually make all of your symptoms worse if that happens make sure you go and check my my other video that I made recently called, called something along the lines of if probiotics make it worse they'll make it better so when it when you take a probiotic and it makes you feel bad it's not actually the probiotic it's what the probiotic is doing in your body when it is interacting with the microbes that are already inside of your body that are causing your disease symptoms so they don't like that and they will fight and they will make you feel worse. It just means you need to do it slowly. You need to do it gently. So that would be the first thing that I would suggest. The second thing, and I don't know if you had any, um, I'm not going to say the word, I'll do the thing. If you had any, uh, you know, in your, in your arm, if you did that, or if you are around people that have done that, you may find that there's a, an aspect here of prion prion illness so if you have uh, received that uh, that medical treatment anyone that has received that will be creating something called prions so prions are a they're basically a misfolded protein and i like to adopt a perspective on this that the body is really intelligent and it has natural mechanisms to handle this so the best way to encourage the body's natural mechanisms that break prions down because prions aren't new we've had prions before the this before before covid before before any of this they've existed the body misfolds proteins all the time like it happens it's a, it's a part of life and it has natural mechanisms to break them down and the way that you can the way that you can improve how your body is doing that is first of all thermotherapy particularly heat exposure so like saunas um, Epsom salt baths or just like really hot baths, sauna rooms, sauna blankets, anything that gets you hot will increase uh, a type of, I believe they're called heat shock proteins or I can't, I, it's eluding me, but there's a process that is sped up in the presence of the body being, being hot and it will break these prions down faster. The second would be fasting. Fasting is amazing because your body is, wants to break everything down that it doesn't want to use as fuel or to use as resources to keep functioning. So it's going to go around the body, find these prions and just clean them up and eat them and, and break them down and turn them into, into new things. Break these old misfolded proteins down into the base amino acids and then reuse them to create new proteins for, for different functions. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, here, Kaylin in, in the chat is saying, my infrared chair has been game-changing in the lime battle. Also baths big time mold and lime. Yeah, it, he is like one of the oldest therapies on the, on the planet. It's uh, really, really powerful. So those would be my first, like, let's say broad spectrum suggestions. To get any more specific, we'd probably have to have a consult, but you'd probably be following a plan, something along, along the lines of that. Correct the microbiome, primarily lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, especially bifidobacterium, and then incorporating things that can help your body with this recycling process, being the heat exposures and the, the fasting. But obviously there's nuance to that, but these are just some broad spectrum ideas for you to, for you to think about. So in the chat just here, Dana, Dana Bondi, nice to have you, Dana. Dana, Dana, let me know. How am I supposed to say it? says, could you please describe a histamine reaction? I can do my best, but this looks different for everyone. So when you're thinking about histamine reaction, you, do, you want to think about what the functions of histamine are. So any, anywhere in your body where you have like a presence of histamine or you have histamine receptors, that's likely where you're going to be experiencing a histamine reaction. So you've got four types of histamine receptors. 
Uh, one of them is in your brain, one of them is in your stomach or in the upper part of your digestive system. One of them is a part of your immune system that you have like in your mucosa and your sinuses. I don't remember where the other one is, but it's somewhere. So if you are having a histamine reaction, it's going to affect these in, in, in what, some of these in some way. You, the last one might be in your skin because you can get some histamine reactions in your skin. Um, so in your stomach, like a histamine reaction might look like gastritis or like acid problems, maybe too much acid, maybe not enough. Um, gastritis, uh, reflux, these kinds of things. You could see that there. If you're looking at the histamine receptor in your nose, you could look like, so you might be getting um, like itchy eyes, runny eyes, itchy nose, uh, itchy face, um, just a feeling of like uh, irritation on your on your mucous membranes and also like maybe on your on your skin. So it could be it could, on your skin, it can be anywhere. Um, in your, so you've also got histamine receptors in your brain. So this can cause anxiety. This can cause depression, panic attacks. For me, when I had a really high dose of histamine, I felt like suicidal, like this, this like, it was almost like this biological need to like kill myself immediately. Like I, it's really hard to describe, but it was, it wasn't really a feeling. It was like a, it was a biochemical thing that was happening in my brain. Like my brain was like massively out of balance. Um, Everyone has different histamine reactions and they always look different and you don't have to have all of these. You know, I didn't really get the, the skin things. For me, it was like my eyes would run and it would feel like my, uh, my eyes had like barbed wire in them and they were extremely, extremely uncomfortable. And the anxiety, the panic, the insomnia, insomnia was a huge one for me. Like if I had, uh, if my, my histamine levels were high, I could lay in bed for four hours. I could lay in bed from like 10 p.m. until 2 p.m. And in this weird, like, hypnotic state, like, I'm not asleep, but I'm not awake, but I'm in this, like, weird trance. And that's because histamine's a neurotransmitter, and it really impacts your brain and your ability to, to sleep. So it looks different for everyone. Um, Kaylin here is saying um, she keeps uh, homeopathy handy for histamine flares. It's excellent at calming skin flares and runny nose. That's really cool. I haven't really played with homeopathy, but I think uh, there, there is something to it. So... That might be a, a nice option for for keeping those things under control. And Gabriella's saying she can she can really relate. She's going through that right now. She can she can resonate with the panic, the doom, the depression, insomnia. Yeah, and it always looks different for everyone. You know, I have some clients that have um, histamine issues. It doesn't affect their mood at all. They'll just get a little bit itchy. Or I have some clients that have no problems like that. But it's all all in the gut. It's like just a like stomach stomach issues, like they don't have any of the itchiness, none of the mood stuff. So it really impacts everyone. And this is largely due to genetics. It's largely due to like toxic load on your body and other epigenetic factors, um, gut flora, like they all influence it in a, in a different way. So you don't have to have one, you don't have to have all, you can have like a, a completely different mix or combination. There's, there's not really any way that you can know until, until it happens. But I will say histamine is a solvable problem and don't let anybody tell you that it isn't. I've, I've resolved it. I've seen lots of other people resolve it too. Like you can heal histamine intolerance. So don't let anyone tell you you can't because you can. I know that in some histamine groups, they say, oh no, you just have to, you just have to deal with it. So I just want to debunk, debunk that. Like you, you can fix it. I've seen a lot of people do it. Kayla says, you put, you put in what, you put in words the feeling so well. Thank you. My son needs to understand this is why he's feeling uh, so unstable. Yeah, I can do it because I felt it, you know, I can really, uh, I've lived the experience. So I really know what it's, what it's like. It's not just like I read it in a textbook. I've actually like, I've, I've felt it. So it, I can, I really think I can vocalize it very well because I've, I've been there. And those, those four hours that I would spend in bed, not being able to sleep, I would be thinking about, about, about this, you know, that's kind of where, you, that's kind of where you go. So we have another question here from Jane, um, SIBO treatment. So again, I kind of covered that already, so I'm not going to cover it, but I do have more videos on YouTube. So you can, again, go on YouTube, William Dickinson, and search SIBO, um, how to treat SIBO, um, SIBO tips and tricks. Like I've got a bunch of videos. There's a gut health playlist with like 30 videos. I think there's more than that. There's nearly 60 videos now. There's at least six SIBO videos in there. So you can go and check those out. Oh, I have a question here from, from Donna, not from today, but from when she commented on my post originally. So Donna, I don't know if you know, but I'm re I'm reading the questions that were commented on my post four days ago. And here you have a question. How do stress, anxiety, and trauma affect the gut and what to do about it? So that's a really cool question. So with regards to the stress and anxiety, you have to think about it like this. Your body 
cannot distinguish between different types of stress. It doesn't, it doesn't notice, it doesn't, there is, to, as far as your body is concerned, there is no difference between chemical toxicity in your body causing stress versus a structural imbalance, like a problem in your knee or a problem in your ankle or a problem in your tendons. And like uh, a tiger chasing you, like the, all of these are stress and your body cannot differentiate between them. The, the response is always the same. The, the response to, the response to all of these stresses is the same. And what will happen is your stress hormones will rise. So like your cortisol, your adrenaline, these hormones will come up. As these come up, like your cortisol is directly correlated with your intestinal permeability. So the higher your cortisol is, the more leaky your gut is. So in, when your body is stressed, like when your cortisol is high, when your body is in fight or flight, all of your, your parasympathetic nervous, nervous system is dysregulated. It becomes, it's not important. So you will have lower stomach acid. You will produce less digestive enzymes. You will produce less bile. Your motility will be less powerful and your mucosa will be leaky. From a five pillars perspective, everything gets shut down. None of it works as well. And you asked here as well, and how does trauma affect the gut? The thing is, imagine you had a really big trauma that happened, right? Maybe a tiger was chasing you, or maybe you had a car crash, or you had some really big danger. What can happen is you experience this trauma, and this can be a physical trauma, like a car crash, but this can also be the emotional trauma. So this can be a loss. This can be like having a car crash, but not fully processing it emotionally. Even if the body completely heals physically from the physical from the physical trauma, it might not recover from the emotional trauma of the stress of the experience of how scary it was. And what happens is you're experiencing all of this stress. And again, it doesn't matter where it's coming from. This can be, this could be like if you're living in mold for a really long time, it doesn't have to be like an acute stress, like a car crash. If your body is, gets, experiences this chronic or like this really, really like a, a more stress than it can handle and your stress hormones are pumped all the way up, they can kind of get frozen. So it's like your stress hormones are like, ooh, they get to the top and your body is like overwhelmed and then it's almost like it takes a picture and it's like flash. And then this picture, your body is holding it. Your body is holding it. And even though you're going about your life now, you're like going for a walk, you're going to do your groceries, you're trying to eat healthy, your body is still holding on to that really big stress response. It hasn't been able to let go of it. It's holding it. So even if you're like, you're, you can lay in bed and like be completely relaxed, but you're, you're in your brain, you can't calm down. And in your body, you know something's wrong. It, you know you're stressed, like you feel something feels wrong. Even though you're like in a completely calm environment, maybe it's silent outside. Maybe you're like, it's super calm but your body is holding that stress. And if that's true, it will reduce your stomach acid. It will reduce your digestive enzymes. Your motility will shut down. Your liver isn't working. Your body is in fight or flight. It's not doing any of your rest and digest processes. It's not important because it's, it's holding this trauma of this, this big traumatic event that's flashed and it's still there. So you need to process that. You need to process that trauma and that can take time. My suggestion is if this is somatized, so if you're, if you feel like there's a disconnect between your mind and your body, if you're, if in your head, you're like, I'm not really that stressed. I'm not really that anxious. Like, I don't know why my body is like being, I don't know. Sometimes it can feel like, why is my body being such a drama queen? Like, would you stop? Like, would you just stop hurting me? Like, would you get out of the way and let me heal? If it feels like that, you have a disconnect and your brain and your body have become disconnected. And the best kind of thing that you can do to work on this would be somatic, like somatic therapy or somatic, somatic based exercises to connect back to the body again, to be able to open that trauma that's stuck and work through it so your body can let it go. And then it doesn't have to hold it anymore. And it can actually move back to that homeostatic place where it can go into rest and digest again. So I do have more videos that, of that again in, on, on YouTube. So you can go on YouTube and talk about what, and you can search William Dickinson, how to heal trauma. Like I have a comprehensive video. It's like 50 minutes long, just talking about how to, how to heal trauma. But it's a very good question and it's very important. It's a, I'm really, really, I'm really, really happy you asked that question because it's a, it's a good one. And a lot of people, they don't, they don't, they don't go there or they don't want to go there. But it's important because if your body is stuck in a fight or flight response or if it's holding a trauma you can do you can take all the supplements you want do all the best diets you can do, it just doesn't matter it's not going to be the thing that changes the situation for you 
So here, Sue Barker says, what, what about if you have MCAS, can you still cure histamine? Yes, you can. MCAS is also reversible. You've just got to think about it from the perspective of your mast cells are intelligent. They're not stupid. They don't just activate for no reason. Something is pissing them off. Something is activating them. Something is triggering them. So we have to figure out what that is. And usually this is either some kind of accumulated toxicity. It's some kind of gut dysbiosis. It's something. It, this even can be emotions as well. Like I, I personally had MCAS and I know that, yes, I had some physical things. I had a lot of mold and mycotoxin exposure. I had a lot of gut dysbiosis, but I also know I had a lot of trauma and my body, my nervous system was responding to my emotions by activating the immune system and that was causing some of my MCAS as well. So yes, you can, you can, res you can reverse MCAS and histamine. I know because I have done it. I've seen other people do it as well, but you do have to do it comprehensively. You do have to go everywhere that it takes you. Cand Candice Little here says, can you fully cure SIBO? Again, yes, you can, but it's it's a process. You, I don't like the word cure because it's kind of like, I think that when you look at the word cure, you're kind of thinking like, I can take a pill and it's going to go away or it's never going to happen ever again. The thing is, when you see that SIBO is a symptom, it's adaptive, when you really like, when you truly come to a place where you understand how SIBO works and you see that SIBO itself is not a bad thing, it's actually a symptom of your body trying to survive, trying to adapt. You actually never want your SIBO to go away. You'll be, you'll say, I'm really happy my SIBO is here because it's doing a job. It's helping my body be as healthy as it can be in the current circumstances. And the SIBO is doing a job. And when the job is done, the SIBO will go away. And if that job is ever not done again, then your body will bring the SIBO back. So if you ever get exposed to a toxin or if for some reason your stomach acid is low and you're not digesting your food correctly, SIBO will come back. But as soon as you correct that, as soon as you're digesting your food correctly, as soon as you detox whatever you were exposed to, the SIBO will go away again because it's a symptom. It's a symptom. So yes, you can totally resolve it, but not by looking at the SIBO. You have to go higher up because you need to go to the top of the stream of the problem. You can't, it's like splashing around in the ocean and being concerned that there's so much water there, but it's like, look at the river that's feeding the ocean. You need to go all the way back up the river, all the way up the mountain to where it's coming out of the ground. Like that's where the ocean originates. That's where you need to look. The SIBO is like all the way at the bottom. You need to go all the way back to the top. Cool. Uh, so let's check. Any more questions here? No, all seems good. I'm reading all of your things, Kaylin. I'm just not gonna read them out, but it's, it's good to read, okay. Next question. If anyone has questions, again, please let me know. I only have so many questions here, so. This is a good one. Charlotte Gracias. That's a good surname. How to stop histamine intolerance reactions that are gut-related? I thought I got on top of it, and then it happened again. So, histamine intolerance gut reactions. So, my first my first suggestion is going to be check out the check out the guide on YouTube. It's far more comprehensive than what I could cover here. Um, there's, I have two thorough gui guides that walk you through supplementation, like what is actually the, like how histamine intolerance is caused and why you have those symptoms and what you can, like what you can, what you can do about it. And it's like full supplement guide. It talks about genetics. It, it's, it's a really thorough guide. So just YouTube, it's like William Dickinson, histamine intolerance or William Dickinson, how to heal histamine intolerance. I have several guides on it. It's uh, pretty comprehensive. But I just want you to, I, I can feel in this in this comment that there's a lot of like, there's some emotion there, like, I thought I got rid of it and it's come back. And it's like, maybe a bit sad, a bit depressed. This is a, a process, like healing is non-linear. It's not, it doesn't go for like from bottom to top. And it doesn't even go like this. It's not even wiggly. It's like this, like this is healing, okay? It's like this giant mess of, just because you're having a symptom again, doesn't mean it's gonna be like that for the rest of your life. It's probably just like a little flare up. There's probably just one little thing that's just out of balance you get that thing back in balance, it will go away again. Like it's probably not as bad as you think. It's very easy to, especially when you've had a really bad experience in the past with something, when, as soon as you have a little flare up, you're like, oh my God, I'm going back there. And it's like, whoa, it's like very viscerally, very scary. But that's probably not happening. You probably got something just a little bit out of balance. You just need to recorrect it. If you, if you got it, if you already did it once. So you say, you says, you thought you got on top of it, you will get on top of it again. Just keep doing the things that you need to do. Keep working on it and check out the full guide if you if you need any extra help there. Question here. 
Subarca, what about oxalates and salicylates? However, it's spelt. Yeah, that's a good one. I, I always use, I always have to, I always have to use my autocorrect to figure out, oh, sorry. I always have to use my autocorrect to figure out how to spell salicylates. Oxalates and salicylates are more, com are more complex. I would say histamine intolerance is like six out of 10, like difficulty level. I'd say oxalates are like, eight out of 10 difficulty level and salicylates are like nine out of 10 difficulty level. They are, they are, I would say they are harder to heal. They will take more time, but it's possible. I've seen people heal both. So again, people that tell you like it's for life, it doesn't have to be. I have seen people reverse it, but it is more complex. They both indicate that you have some metabolic dysfunction. So histamine is usually more of a gut based problem unless you have MCAS, then it's a more of an immune system problem, which also involves the gut. If you've got oxalates and salicylate problems, you definitely have a gut problem. There's always some kind of gut problem to start, but your metabolic processes have become imbalanced because your body is supposed to be able to handle and process oxalates and salicylates. It has pathways in the metabolism in the liver to break these things down and remove them. If you are having reactions to them, it means that these pathways aren't working correctly. It means that your body's metabolism isn't healthy. It's not working correctly. And I emphasize this because you've probably been able to eat oxalates and salicylates in your life before and you had no problems, but now you do. It's like your metabolism was functioning differently then than it is now. So if we can figure out why your metabolism, what metabolism isn't working correctly or optimally. And again, it's probably working optimally for your current environment. If we can change the environment, and that might mean your location, that might mean your diet, that might mean your microbiome, that might mean the foods you eat, it might mean a lot of different things. But if we change those things, you can find tolerance again, and you can get to a point where you can eat oxalates and salicylates without, without having a problem. It is possible. It is more complex. I will, I will say that. It is not... And I don't want to say like histamine intolerance is easy. You know, it's not, an, it's not easy. Like anyone that's got the, those symptoms, like, and I, would, and I would be saying easy, you would say, like, you don't know. Like, I know I've had histamine intolerance and MCS. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's more simple. It's more straightforward. His, uh, oxalates and salicylates, far more complex. We've got Ryan Owens checking in from Tampa, Florida. Nice to see you, Ryan. Got health QA. Any questions you have, let me know. I know we had a little chat a while back, a little way back looking at your, I think we're looking at your liver and your gallbladder. That's part of your digestive system. If you've got any questions that you need to follow up on, now is the time to ask me. Gabrielle Kitt says, do you have to use H1 and H2 blockers? You do not have to do anything. There is no one way to, to heal. I've never used antihistamines to, to heal my, I didn't use histamines or mast cell stabilizers at all to heal my, my histamine intolerance. I will say, if you do have the option to use a medication that works for you and doesn't give you any significant negative consequences, in my opinion, I think you would be silly to not use them. Your quality of life is the most valuable thing you have. And if you can use medications to like help your sleep and to uh, improve your quality of life so that you can think more clearly, make more money, like do things that are going to actually help you to heal, I think you would be silly not to do them. But you do not need them. I did not use them. I was too sensitive and intolerant to things. I didn't use any any of those things. Question from Ryan. Should I take a probiotic at night? I think the best time to take them is either first thing in the morning, before food, with a glass of water, or at night, right before you go to bed. However, I think you've got an aura ring. I think you do, Ryan. What I would do is check, do 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 some testing, do some split testing. See what see how your heart rate variability is affected when you take the probiotic in the morning versus at night and see which one gives you better results. If I take probiotics before I go to bed, it it trashes me. Like my sleep my sleep score is is terrible and I can feel it like my gut doesn't like it. But I do it in the morning and I and I feel great. So that's how it works for me. So test my, my suggestion would be test it. But yeah, ideally first thing in the morning before food on an empty stomach with water or last thing before you go to bed at night. Gabrielle Kidd says, I just surrendered to a sleep medication, which has been hard. Yeah, I totally get it. Did you, tr have you tried? One thing I always suggest for sleep is the earthing and grounding equipment. So I have mine actually just here. So it's basically like a cable that just plugs in to the wall. Oh, let me get it. And you just put it around your wrist when you sleep, just like that. Or around your, around your ankle. This helps me sleep so much. It really makes a massive difference. I feel it if I don't use it. So the suggestion maybe will be helpful. Um, Sue says, I'm having oxalates coming out of my eyes and my skin. That's really hard. I've seen, 
I actually had a 1.6 millimeter kidney stone. So it's like a kidney stone that was this big, oxalate kidney stone. So I did have some oxalate problems myself. I had to have surgery to get that removed because it was so big. I can't imagine the pain that it must feel like having them coming out of your eyes though. That must be really, really uncomfortable. I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry, see, that's tough. Uh, Daniela Zerm. Daniela Zerm says, what do you think is the underlying cause of MCAS that has developed after a COVID-19 infection or vaccine? So it's it's pretty much universally uh, dysautonomia or basically you've caused a, it's like a, a maladaptive uh, immune response. So the, the immune system has become dysregulated. It's not, it's not responding correctly or it is responding correctly, but there is now something in the body that it is, that the immune system is trying to remove. So this could be connected to kind of, as I was saying earlier, when you like one of the things that's really common in long COVID is your gut gets trashed and you lose your lactobacillus and your bifidobacterium that can cause leaky gut that can cause endotoxemia and you can develop MCS because of that. If you have MCAS, you should always look in your gut first. It's very rare that you will have MCAS and not have anything wrong with your gut. I would always work in the gut first. Um, but what I would actually suggest, uh, Daniela is, when I finish this, watch it back because I already talked about uh, long COVID in some detail. So I would rewatch it on 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 that section because it will answer your questions really nicely. Excuse me, <coughs> throat's getting a bit dry. Pam says I need flagell to calm infection every few years. I have mastocytosis. Is there a way to prevent these infections? I'm very salicylate sensitive. I would say you probably need to work the microbiome and your best option is probably playing with some different probiotics. Um, you could look at some spore based organisms maybe to start. And then I really like the custom probiotics brand, the D lactate free formula. I find that's really, really, uh, really, really great. Really, really helpful, really, um, well tolerated by people that have sensitivities and intolerances. But uh, as I said, like salicylates is, is one of the more complex, uh, issues. It's an indicator that you've got a, a multi-level dysfunction of several systems in your body, probably including gut, liver, immune system, and overall uh, metabolism as well. So you're going to need to address all of those simultaneously if you want things to, you want things to, to change. Gabrielle said, just got a grounding sheet. Cool. Good job. Yeah. Grounding sheets work just as well. I just think they're a bit more of a hassle with cleaning. You know, I can just, I mean, honestly, I don't even wash it. You don't really sweat that much on your ankles, do you? So it's, it's fine. Uh, let's have a look here. So Kaylin says, yeah, Kaylin's having oxalates coming out of her eyes as well. That's nice. Uh, Gabrielle says, uh, Gabrielle Kidd says, could you speak to high levels of homocysteine and not being able to meth, I think that's methylate. Best thing that you can do is the best thing for homocysteine is methylfolate. Unquestionably, best the best thing. Um, if you have low levels of methylfolate, you will have high homocysteine. You might want to do a genetic panel. You might want to do a, like a 23andMe or Ancestry.com and run it through some software to show you your SMPs, your single nucleotide polymorphisms, and take a look at your your methylation status from a genetic perspective, and then work on supporting your body however you can. Methylation is pretty complex. It's basically, I'm going to say, almost impossible for me to tell you what to do from a, a video like this. Um, but yeah, if you've got high homocysteine, that's like bad. Homo high homocysteine is really bad. It's connected to a lot of ADHD and autistic-like behaviors, uh, attention deficit. It puts you at risk for cardiovascular disease. The best way to lower it is to provide methyl donors to your body, namely methylfolate is generally the best option. So that's where I would start, but that's not always possible. You know, not everyone can always do that. So it's hard for me to say, but methylation support can be really helpful. That's probably your best option to get that lower. Kaylin says some probiotics once a day or would twice a day be better? I always have just an AM dose, honey at night, spoonful. Everyone's different. Um, I have some clients that do better with a morning and an evening dose. If they do too much in the morning, they don't feel as good. But if they split it, they do better. I have some clients that do four doses in a day because if they do a big dose, they don't. it doesn't really work for them. But if they do four smaller doses through the day, they can get to a significantly higher dose. So 
doesn't have to be. Um, I can't say if it's going to be better or worse. Only you will know by trying and seeing how you feel. Uh, Ryan says, nice to see you still here, Ryan. Uh, how can I know if I have low stomach acid? I don't have a gallbladder. Um, I would say you, you'd probably know if you did. It's a bit more obvious, I would say. So if, if you've got like gastritis or like the burning feeling in the left side of your stomach, if you've got like heartburn or reflux, if you've got like observably undigested food in your stool, especially like meat, like if you can see undigested meat in your stool, you have low stomach acid. I would say, you, I don't I don't think you do, Ryan. Knowing what I know of you, I don't think you do. I think it would be more obvious if you, if you did. Um, what you can do is try adding some acids to your food, like vinegar and lemon juice, and see if it makes you feel better, or see if you feel like it makes your digestion lighter. Uh, if it does, that might be a good a good measure. That could be could be something to something to try. So, oh, Georgie Porgy, nice to see you. So, Georgie Porgy says, I have super low HRV when I go to rest slash sleep, under ten. I've tried so many things for years, but I can't increase. I have dysautonomia at times. Any suggestions? So, excuse me. <coughs> so HRV, your, one thing that I've noticed is your HRV, your heart rate variability, is almost directly inversely correlated with your heart rate. So if your heart rate, it comes down, your heart rate variability goes up. This is a really good measure of stress response. And your... If, you're, if you can't make your heart rate variability increase, like if you can't get your heart, you can't, you can't get your heart rate variability up, your body is, is stuck in sympathetic, is stuck in a sympathetic nervous system state. It, it can't move into parasympathetic. The, the increased HRV is a sign that you're, you're shifting into a parasympathetic nervous system state. So what that's telling you is your body is not, doesn't feel safe for, for some reason or another. And and maybe you you may want to watch this again because I was talking about this earlier, but I'll touch on it very lightly. Your body doesn't distinguish between different types of stress. If it's chemical stress, if it's structural stress, if it's emotional stress, if it's mental stress, the body does not care. It responds in the same way. And if you've got stress or if you have stress that was so much that it basically got frozen into your body as trauma, you will be holding that and your body will not be able to enter a rest and digest nervous system state you will not be able to get into parasympathetic and you will not be able to get your heart rate variability scores to increase because your body is still holding on to a fight or flight fight flight freeze situation and it and it can't let it go so it can't move into a relaxed uh, into a relaxed state uh, okay next question we have Gabrielle Kid says she has a burning on the left side of the stomach area. Has always thought it was an ulcer. Um, I think I think if you have an ulcer, like you will really know. Um, I have I have this as well. I have a burning feeling on the left side of my stomach. Um, if you have an ulcer, like you will know, like it's unbearable. Like you literally feel like you're dying. Um, but working on healing that stomach lining, it can be really really helpful. But it's a process, and again, best thing to do it is probiotics but it's something that takes time. You know, I've been doing it for, I've been doing it for years. You know, it takes time. You don't get to control how fast it happens. Just keep plodding along in the right direction. Uh, Ryan says, what is a good HRV from the aura ring? Mine is usually in the 40s. Good question. I'm going to say it depends because you have to look at people's context. You know, if you live a super stressful life and you don't get that much downtime versus if you have like a chronic disease, like it's going to be different. What I would say is a better measure is not what is a good HRV. You want to look at what is your HRV trend. Is your HRV increasing or decreasing? And if you go on Aura, you can look and you can you can look at your HRV and you can look at the trend over the last couple of months. Look at it. If it's a thing that's going up, if your HRV is increasing, that's all that matters. If it's staying still or going down, that's bad. It means that you're moving towards disease or you're just staying where you are and you want to be healing. Heal there's a, I heard a thing the other day that was something along the lines of everything in nature is growing and if it's not growing, it's dying. So if your HRV is not increasing and you're not moving closer and closer towards healing and rest and relaxation, you are dying. Like that, it, it, that's simple. So I'm going to say the actual measurement doesn't really matter because you are where you are and there's nothing you can do about that. You're right where you are right now. What is important is what's the trend, what's the trajectory? 
are you moving towards improving your heart rate variability or is it getting worse? That's actually what's important here. Okay, let's just scroll down here. So Daniela says, thank you, I'll watch it back. My bifido is good, but I have zero lactobacillus. Leaky gut too. I've tried working on my gut for months, but haven't really seen much success. I bought your gut health bundle and have started to implement some things. Fingers crossed. Thank you, Daniela. That's really cool. I'm really glad to hear that you that you, that you you bought it and you're, you're doing some things there. Yeah, I would say... I find lactobacillus can... I find people that struggle to colonize lactobacillus usually have some emotional work to do with, so this is, and tell me if I'm wrong, but I, I won't be surprised if I'm right. People that have low lactobacillus usually need to do some trauma and emotional work around self-worth and empowerment and having healthy angry and healthy anger and, and like using uh, boundaries energy well. I find they're really, really connected. So you might find that if you do some work there, you know, maybe this looks like going to a therapist. Maybe this look, looks like pushing yourself out of your comfort zone a little bit. I don't know. I don't really know you, but general, a general thing that I've observed is people that have low lacto or non-colonizing lacto usually have low self-worth, low confidence, poor boundaries. These are things that, that usually need to be worked. So tell me, am I right or wrong? I'd be really interested to, to hear. Sue says, are you from the UK? Yes, I'm from the UK, but I'm currently in Germany, but I actually live in Portugal. So kind of a bit of a globe trotter at the moment. Daniela says, another question. I can't seem to tolerate methyl folate without intense reactions, anxiety, palpitations, inner vibrations, insomnia, even though I have the EMTHFR mutation and would need it. Any advice on how to fix that? Yeah, so what you're doing is you're probably throwing your body out of balance. You're providing something that's speeding up a massive amount of reactions and it's just completely frazzling your body. So I would suggest you actually try and increase your methylfolate from whole food forms. So try and find foods that, have, that are high in methylfolate and get as much of them from food as possible. Because when you get them from food, it's going to be balanced. You're going to be able to get a whole, you're going to get a whole complex of different things, which is going to not cause such an extreme reaction. And you'll probably notice if you take the dose isolated, it gives you, react, gives you the reaction. But if you take that dose, from a whole food form, you have no problems. And that's because it's not actually the methylfolate that's the problem, it's probably a cofactor somewhere. Maybe it's copper, maybe it's molybdenum, maybe it's zinc. It doesn't really matter if you eat in a whole food form, you get all of those other things peripherally. So focus on getting your methylfolate dose up from whole food forms. So ideally try to get to like maybe six or 800 milligrams a day and then try and work on a lower dose. You can also provide methyl donors in another way. So you could look at choline supplements. You could look at methylated B12. Like you can provide methyl donors in a different way. Some people don't do well with that. There are also other forms like folinic acid that you could try too. Okay, next question. Uh, can B12 irritate the bladder with histamine issues? So that's from Charlene Dardle. I, I, I don't know. I don't see why not. Um, I, I mean, I've seen crazier things. I don't have any experience with observing if B12 irritates the bladder. Um, I would say it depends on the form. It depends on how you're putting it into your body as well. Um, it could be, if you're taking it orally, it could be feeding certain bacteria, which then produce toxins that are absorbing and your body's excreting them through the urine and it's irritating the bladder. It could be that it's boosting methylation and your body's clearing stored toxicity through the bladder and that can cause some irritation i would suggest lower the dose and build it up slowly and see if if that 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 fixes things a lot of the time you're doing the right thing but it's just the dose that needs calibrating so maybe play with the dose and see see what that does see if that changes anything okay gabrielle we have i'm going to finish this up soon i'm going to try and do this for an hour so we've got maybe five minutes before we finish up so if you have any more questions chuck them in Gabrielle, just give me one sec. <coughs> it's a lot of talking and I'm still not fully recovered from my cold. <clears throat> Gabrielle Kidd says, do you feel like you need to accept symptoms and conditions before things can really change? Let go of the fix mentally, which is scary, especially with the anxiety panic, but uh, just want things to go away. But is there a level of being with what is before healing can happen? There totally is. And you, based on the way that you've worded this and what you've said, I know where you're going with this. I know you're looking into like spirituality and you're looking for, you're trying to find meaning and you're trying to, you're basically trying to implement the, the laws of like the law of attraction. And you're trying to, you, you're kind of like what you resist persists. That's kind of what you're talking about here. It's like, you're holding onto it 
and it, that stops it from changing. So yes, you have to let it go. But that also doesn't mean in a dismissive way. You can feel bad. It can make you feel scared. And it's not just about like being optimistic or being positive. But there does some com there does come some level of acceptance. And especially if this healing is more on the emotional side, anytime you time you try to fix feminine energy or anytime you try to fix trauma or you fix emotions, you just make it a million times worse because you can't fix emotions because they're not broken. In these cases, what we need to do is learn to experience them and to be with them. And they just they just go away by themselves. But often we get stuck and like maybe to other people and I've, I've actually got this like from family and friends and I see this a lot of people are, they said like it's in your head and you don't want to change or you don't want to do it differently the thing is it, it, that's not true it's that you do want to and you do want to heal and you do want things to change but you don't know how it's like you don't have the tools it's like yeah I want to build a tree house but I don't have any wood and I don't have a toolbox and it's like well you're never going to do it then are you it's exactly the same situation you can want to change these things, but if you don't know how, you can't. If you've got these these traumas that you want to like let go of, or if you've got this like situation that you want to accept, but you don't know how, you can't do it because you don't know how. So learning how to do those things is the next step. And that's often why we're giving the given these situations in the first place. We're given these problems so that we can learn how to do something. I've learned so much about myself, about the world, about so many things through my through my healing process. And it does kind of suck a bit while you're in it and you just want it to finish. But I promise you it does get to a point where healing becomes at least, let's say, semi-enjoyable. It becomes quite a beautiful uh, process that you can kind of fall in love with. Ryan says, do I just need to get my emotional life together? Seems like stomach issues are heavily related to emotional stability, no? I'm, I'm not going to say it's like just an emotional thing because there's a, there's a balance here. But I will say the emotional side is neglected. A lot of people neglect the emotional side and they say, I have physical symptoms, it must be a physical problem. And I guarantee you, I have first-hand experience that that is not always true. If you have undigested emotions, you will have digestive problems, full stop. It doesn't matter what probiotics you take, it doesn't matter how well you do food combining, it doesn't matter what type of digestive enzymes you take. If you have undigested emotions, you will have digestive problems, full stop. So I can't say it's just do the emotional stuff and you'll be fine, but it is the most neglected area of gut healing is working on the emotional stuff. If you need any pointers there, or you need any help with that, shoot me a DM, you know where to find me. Okay. Kaylin says, but it's worse if doctors gaslight, gaslight you and deny the treehouse exists too. Yeah, that's a whole other story, Kaylin. I, <laughs> I can, I can relate. But, but yes, I made a post uh, earlier today, and the the number, like the biggest complaint that I hear from people when they come to work with me is, like, people don't believe me, or they just tell me what to do, and they're not actually listening to me. It's like, how can you be? How can you heal? How can you find healing if you're not involved in the healing process? Like, you're the one doing the healing. Like, <laughs> you're really important in this. Uh, Ryan said, uh, thanks, William. Enjoy your, jet. your enjoy your day. You too, Ryan. I hope that's really helpful. Take care. Um, Daniela says, thank you for your advice regarding the emotional work. Personally, I don't think I have low self-esteem and consider myself pretty good at having boundaries. Good for you. That's really cool. I'm happy to hear that. I never had any health issues before the COVID infection right after that. Uh, right after that, my gut issues. Sorry, it keeps moving. Right after that, the gut issues started and I developed MCAS, so I doubt it's connected to my emotions, but I'll definitely stay open minded to the emotional side of it all. So, as I just said, emotions are really neglected, but there are physical things that happen too. You know, um, if, it, if you're saying this is all happening after COVID, definitely look at your lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. You could do a gut test, or you could just try and take supplements and see what happens. I don't know how much weight I put in gut tests, but you could you could try and, and see how you feel, or you could do the testing and, and see. But you can like you can go on Reddit and you can look at the long COVID Reddit and like universally every single person in there has low bifidobacterium or low lactobacillus. They they have they, they, it really affects the, the gut. It's a really important thing to address. Um Sivon Oh, that's a really hard one to say. Sivon 
Torb Johnson, let's say, says, does meat feed parasites? I would say anything pe feeds parasites if you can't digest it. So if you eat food that you can't digest, it will feed parasites. If you eat meat and you can't digest it, it will feed parasites. If you eat grains and you can't digest them, it will feed parasites. If you eat the healthiest diet that ever existed on planet Earth and you can't digest it, you will feed parasites. It's less about what you eat and more about what you're able to digest. That's more of an influencing uh, factor. Uh, Charlene says, thank you for your answer and suggestions on the B12. You're most welcome. I hope that's helpful. So we are at perfect five seconds over. So that's it for today. If you like it, if you like this video, uh, please be sure to let me know. I took an hour out of my day to try and uh, give something back and try to be helpful, try to share everything that I've learned through my healing experience. If you appreciate it, I would really appreciate it if you'd let me know that you appreciate it. <laughs> um, if you liked it, do let me know and I'll do this again. This is something I could do like maybe once a month on Sundays or, or something. It's quite fun. So if you, if you liked it, let me know you liked it and I'll do it again. And if you appreciate it, I would love for you to tell me that you appreciate it. So that's everything for me. Uh, take care. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye. You're welcome, Gabrielle, and you're welcome, Daniela. Take care.